All right, so Matt, do you know what's odd? What? Anything not divisible by two. <laughs> I, I, I can I can smell <laughs> something like that coming. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. All right, everybody, here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? Man, I'm good. My head hurts a little bit. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so I'm 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 leaving somebody's house today, uh-huh. and their garage door wasn't all the way up, <laughs> and it wasn't totally obvious when I was leaving. It was when I walked in. Right. I forgot. Oh, yeah. And pow! Nice. <laughs> well- I mean- I saw stars, dude. <laughs> well, I don't see a mark, so I think you're. No, it's it's right up here where my headphones oh, are. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a good cover for it, then at least. Yeah. So real quick, we want to uh, say go check out Podbelly dot com, the Podbelly Network. We're proud members of the Podbelly Network, and you can find different tricks and tips, and almost said ticks. If you put <laughs> tips and tricks together, it becomes ticks. But you can find yep. ticks on how to uh, record your own podcast, you know, and different software and stuff like that to use. And you can also find different podcasts to listen to that are also members of the Podbelly Network. So go check them out. We also want to thank tonight's sponsors, uh, the Skeptoid Podcast, Native, and HelloFresh. And we'll talk more about all of them here in just a little bit. And, you know, this is... The second episode of 2021, the first one was a continuation of our listener stories, so we didn't really talk about much new stuff, but we we thought, you know, if this is your first episode that you're listening to, if, if you just found Graveyard Tales and this is the first episode you're listening to, we just wanted to say, look, you know, we do joke around, so... You know, if you if you like that kind of stuff, awesome. You're in good company. Uh, Matt and I only read things blandly if it's for a joke. We try not to do that, uh, you know, monotone, no emotion reading of stuff that you get on a lot of um, ghost TV shows, you know, because yeah. we, we think that's kind of overdramatic. So if you need the overdramatic, we're probably not for you. But hang with us. You might like us anyway. That's right. That's right. We're we're going to put our own spin on all these stories, and we're not going to tell you what to believe. We're just going to give you the info and let you decide. Right. Um, and if this is not your first episode, if you've been with us for a while or since the beginning, thank you. Uh, we're glad to see you back in 2021. Um, we hope this is a big year for us. We're going to be doing more live streams and stuff like that as we get past this holiday season it's been wild for both of us so we haven't been able to do one here in the past month or so but we plan on doing more of that and if you've been with us and you still haven't gotten your whole family and all of your friends to listen to us shame on you um go try harder <laughs> get all of them to listen to us um now but seriously just to spread the word about the graveyard let's get you know make uh, 2021 a year of growth for us we y'all did great last year in getting people into the graveyard and the graveyard tales group so we appreciate that very much but let's yeah. let's get some more people in here we like seeing new faces yeah and you know if you've been if you've been thinking about jumping into patreon to get a video of the show um we're putting that out now and man you can you can log on and see the changes in the graveyard west i mean it looks killer yeah i'm i mean it's it's a it's amazing i'm sitting here, i'm staring at it. i'm seeing it for the first time <laughs> and i'm just i'm shocked i'm like it looks so great yeah man i'm proud of it uh, i like the way it looks got a new uh 
LED sign back there for, uh, I guess it's supposed to be like the neon sign, but, yeah. you know, neon sign look, but obviously there's no neon in that because I don't want to explode my uh, uh, recording studio here. But yeah, I did some work on <laughs> it over the holidays. Have actual neon lately? <laughs> yeah, I can't. I, I don't have that kind of budget. So Me uh, either. <laughs> so we got the lookalike on-air neon sign behind us. Um, so I, I'm happy. And if, if you you can watch the progression, actually, if you go back in our uh, our videos on Patreon, you can watch uh, Matt's Graveyard East change, um, mine change over the months. And we, you know, always upgrading and trying to make it look better for you guys, especially once we started the video. We we're like, oh, crap, we got to make this look decent. People are looking at us. <laughs> so. <That's right. laughs> All right, Matt, so let's talk about our first sponsor tonight, Skeptoid. Now, the Skeptoid podcast since 2006 has been revealing the true science, true history, and true facts behind more than 750 of our most popular urban legends and mysteries. Each episode of Skeptoid looks at a famous story that you know and reveals the part of it you haven't heard. Skeptoid doesn't just stop at the popular legend version of the story, and it doesn't just debunk it. Host and science writer Brian Dunning always goes the extra mile, tells what we know, how we know it, and what the actual solution to the mystery really is. Now, Skeptoid passed 100 million downloads in January of 2017 and has won many podcasting awards over the years, including all three of the biggest ones. Best Education Podcast from the Podcast Awards, Best Fact Behind the Fiction, from Parsec Awards and Best Science Podcast from the Stitcher Awards. Yeah, the best thing about Skeptoid is that it gives the solutions to practically every mystery you've ever wondered about. These aren't just guesses. Skeptoid tells you what they know and how they know it, and it gives exhaustive, authoritative references for everything. And their topics include popular ghost stories like the Amityville Horror, and the true story behind the Conjuring movies. Uh, They touch on UFO cases, like the Majestic 12 documents, what was really in the videos from the Pentagon's $22 million UFO program, Um, cryptids like the Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot film, urban legends like the Bermuda Triangle and the Oak Island Money Pit, conspiracy theories like the JFK assassination. It's content so cool, that it has led to three documentary films and six books based on the podcast. That's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So go find out why everyone is listening to Skeptoid. Get it wherever you get your podcast. Just search for Skeptoid. On that note, Matt, this is new year, new topics. So, What are we talking about tonight, brother? Okay, so tonight we are going to discuss a haunted town, Mm -hmm. okay? The whole town. That's not a big town. It's a pretty small town. Still a town. It's still a town, (laughs) but it's in in Tonopah, Nevada. We have found some pretty fascinating stories. from, you know, w- just weird happenings to full-on apparitions to uh, to sp- spirits of, of people that are possibly buried right there in a really old cemetery that was started around the gold rush. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'd, I'd never heard of this town. I mean... No reason to really have heard about it unless I was, you know, hunting for haunted towns in Nevada. Right, <laughs> Which right. I can't say that I've ever done until now. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, some some really great stories have come out of this and some pretty interesting history. So let's let's dig into this. So Tonopah, Nevada. Nevada, 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 Nevada. Yeah, I'll probably However you want to say it. <laughs> I'll probably say, I'll say it both ways. Yeah, I'll probably say uh, Nevada most of the time, but sometimes I might get fancy and say Nevada. So we'll see. 
you know, but if I say Nevada, I've got to throw my pinky up in the air. You know, Nevada. So <laughs> sounds like you're casting a Harry Potter Potter spell. Or yeah. Uh, that, that, Nevada, Nevada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nevada, Nevada. That just puts a whole bunch of sand in your house is all that does. <laughs> That's the worst spell ever. All right, so Tonopah is a historic mining town that's located between Las Vegas and Reno, and it was the site of one of the richest booms in the West, which took place on May 19th, 1900. Now, to follow along with us, as we always say, go down and check our sources. You can find all the links to everywhere we got this information, and you can see some of the stuff that we left out just for time's sake. You know, you can see what we've put in and then you can dive even further because there's usually links to other sources that they've used and all this stuff. But uh, this little bit that I got here first comes from Tonopah's website, their historical documents of the town and how it was formed and all this other stuff. And there's some small details that are different if you look at different sources um, but we're going with some of the historical documents from Tonopah's history here. So Tonopah Springs, um, later the site of one of the richest booms in the West, was an Indian campground for many years, long before Jim Butler spent a chilly night here. Now, a number of stories exist as to how Butler discovered the ore that was there. Now, the most popular version is that Jim Butler's mule wandered away. And when Butler found the mule, he noticed an outcropping that appeared to be heavily laced with silver. Now, Butler took a number of samples, and the date was May 19th, 1900, as I said before. Now, this it says that this quiet start belied the actual importance of the discovery. Butler firmly believed he had discovered an important silver deposit, but he had trouble convincing the assayer uh, he visited in nearby Klondike. Now, if you don't know what an assayer is, I had to look that up. It's someone who looks at ore and minerals and determines what they are and if they're worth anything. Yeah. So it's a rock man. Don't, um, don't feel bad. I had to look it up, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so the, the fancy name for a rock man told him that the samples were worthless, consisting mainly of iron, and he threw them into the back of his tent. Now, Butler was still convinced that his find was genuine. So on his way back to Monitor Valley Ranch, he stopped at Tonopah Springs once again to gather more samples. Now back at his ranch, Butler put the samples on his windowsill. Not too much time passed before Tasker Oddie, later to be the governor of Nevada, stopped at the ranch and spied the ore samples. He offered to pay for another assay, and Butler agreed... Uh, and Butler, in turn, offered Adi a quarter interest of the assay. Now, Adi heartily agreed, and he took the ore samples to William Gayhart, an Austin assayer, and offered Gayhart a quarter interest in his quarter. So this keeps getting sh smaller here, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Now, this says that Gayhart found an assay ran as high as $600 a ton. So when Adi was notified of the value of the samples, he immediately sent an Indian runner to Butler's ranch to alert him of the rich find. Now, Butler did not react rapidly. He stayed at his ranch to complete the hay harvest and did not even bother to file claims on the load site. Which, to me, that's weird. If you've just found out you've right. got a ton of money that you found, go do that. You know, let somebody else deal with your hay harvest. That's right. This is going to make you a lot more money in that hay. No joke. But, you know, bird in the hand. Right. I guess. I guess so. Now, this goes on to say that news of the, of the discovery traveled to Klondike, and soon scores of eager prospectors were searching around Tonopah Springs to no avail for Butler's load. Now, Butler finally went to Belmont, and on August 27, 1900, he and his wife filed on eight claims near the springs. Six of these, Desert Queen, Burrow, Valley View, Silvertop, Buckboard, and Mizpah. Now, the name Mizpah will come up again here in a little bit when we talk about some of the hauntings. Well, these six turned into some of the biggest producers the state has ever had. Now, work has begun on the Mizpah Mine in October 1900, and a camp called Butler formed nearby. 
On Christmas Day 1900, 14 men were living in the camp, including Butler and Tasker Audi, um, Nye County's new district attorney. Butler decided to lease out all of his claims for one year, from December 1900 to December 1901. Soon, the cry of, quote, Jim, how about a lease, end quote, was heard throughout the bustling camp. Audie and Butler were partners receiving 25% royalty on all gold and silver mined from the Butler claims. That's a good deal. Yeah, yeah. 25%, man. If you, whew, That's like we were talking once before. If I could go back in time and do anything. <laughs> You'd go to Tonopah. I, I, I would go to Tonopah and I would. In 1899. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I'd stake my claim. And I'd say, you owe me 50%. And then I'd take that money and I'd go buy land in Texas. Like I've talked before, we go buy a whole bunch of land in Texas. Now, this goes on to say that the town of Butler uh, began to grow by leaps and bounds. By January 1901, there were 40 men in the camp. The first stagecoach coming from Sodaville arrived in Butler on March 24th, 1901 with seven passengers. It was a two-day trip with an overnight stay at Crow Springs. The camp consisted of seven shacks and a number of tents and a population of 60. Within weeks, the population had grown to 250 people. Huge. That's like uh, 190 people in just a couple weeks. Now, a post office, uh, the postmaster was Willie Sinclair, was named Butler, and it opened at the booming camp on April 10th, 1901. It wasn't until March 3rd, 1905 that the post office changed its name to Tonopah. So if you look into the history of a lot of old towns, like my nerdy butt does a lot, you you find that <laughs> the, the post office, when the post office gets there, then they kind of become an official town and they name the post office after the town or vice versa. You know, the, the right. post office gets there is Butler Camp. So then they're like, OK, we're going to call this the Butler Post Office. So then that that kind of solidifies that name as Butler there for that town. But if they change the name of the town or the name of the post post office, it kind of follows suit. You know, the other one follows suit with it. So they changed it to Tonopah, which would then change the name of the city to Tonopah eventually. So. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just funny how much the post office mattered at that time as far as cities, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, I mean, it, it made the city. Yeah. You really weren't a city until you had a post office. Yep. Yep. So you, you were just eh, yeah, an just, encampment. <laughs> yeah, it was just a camp. And, you know, and it was like until you can actually get your mail delivered to where you're at, it, it – it, you know, it doesn't really matter. Nobody really takes notice of you. But once you can get mail delivered there, then you become a town and people say, OK, I can move there because I can get my mail delivered. So it's just it's interesting. All you history nerds out there like me will understand what I'm talking about. The rest of y'all go, who cares? Get on to the hauntings. We're getting there. <laughs> like like Matt and I have said before, you got to understand this stuff to understand where a lot of the hauntings come from. So hang with us. Now, this goes on to say that by the summer of 1901, Butler was beginning to make its mark on Nevada's silver production figures. Now, the mines around the town produced almost $750,000 in gold and silver in 1901. And for the next 40 years, the Tonopah mines were consistent producers. Can you imagine $750,000 in 1901? Oh, man. You, you could do anything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're above the law at that point. Yeah. Take just a quarter of that, which is what uh, Butler was getting. And you're 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 rich as hell, as they say. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's right. Uh, now, the town now had six saloons, restaurants, a say offices, lodging houses and a number of doctors, lawyers and a rapidly swelling population of six hundred and fifty. So added 400 people into the town at this point. Now, a newspaper came to the town on June 15th, 1901, when W.W. W. Booth, who had published a paper in Belmont, 
set up the Tone of Paul Bonanza. Now, the first issue had this greeting, quote, With this issue, the Tone of Paul Bonanza glides down the typographical ways and into the sea of journalism. Whether its voyage will be a calm and prosperous one, time alone will tell. Uh, it says the Bonanza will at all times act as a freelance, giving credit wherever merited and censure when called for. Our policy in politics will be for the best of the country that the paper will meet with public favor or condemnation is left to the opinion of the reader and advertiser. We have done our best and sincerely hope it will meet your approval. End quote. Lofty goals for that newspaper. <laughs> yeah. Now, Jim Butler had sold out the claims, which were all consolidated, and gave birth to a new company, the Tonopah Mining Company. Now, it was incorporated in Delaware with stock listed on both the Philadelphia and San Francisco exchanges. The company, with J.H. Whiteman as president, controlled 160 acres of mineral-bearing ground around the Tonopah district. The company also had holdings in the Tonopah Goldfield Railroad and controlled mining companies in Colorado, Canada, California, and Nicaragua. The mine workings wait, at Tonopah... Wait, wait. Nicaragua? Yeah. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> how, how do you even... How do you even... Get to Nicaragua in in 1901. I'm not sure. Know, from from Nevada. Yeah, I, 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 a lot of work. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. I mean, think about it. They were they were managing a company. It, I mean, imagine hard enough to manage a company in Colorado and California. Then you're going to add Canada to it. Well, at least we border that country. Right. And then you're going to try to control something in Nicaragua? Right. In right. 1901? How how long would it take for like the news of a strike or something in your Nicaraguan <laughs> factory to get to you? You know. By the time you get it it's over. Yeah, the thing's burned the whole plant is burned down or something by that time because you haven't met their demands and it's like I just heard about it. You know. <laughs> So they were doing good. I mean, if they were uh, managing, you know, had controlled um, control of the mining companies there, they must have been doing something right. Yeah. That's all I can say. Now, the mine workings at Tonopah consisted of three deep shafts with more than 46 miles of lateral workings. Now, the deepest of the three shafts was 1,500 feet. So that's a deep shaft, especially for that time. It's deep now. I mean, going 1,500 feet is deep into the earth. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, foot, the foot hasn't changed over time. No, that's true. <laughs> you know, 1,500 <laughs> feet is 1,500 feet, even if it's 120 years later. Yeah, it's not like there was inflation of the foot, you know. <laughs> inflation of the dollar was one oh. thing, but. You know, it's nowhere near that deep now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, 50, you know, a foot back in the day was uh, it was three inches now, you know, <laughs> so, I mean, it, 1500 feet was just like a scratch in the dirt compared to now. Yeah. You know, that was a swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long, deep hole. All right. So. <laughs> This goes on to say that the ore mined at the site was shipped to Miller's, where it was treated in a hundred stamp mill. The facility was used by the company's mines until suitable treatment facilities were actually built in Tonopah. Now, this says that the Tonopah Belmont Mining Company was also formed in 1902. The Tonopah Belmont Extension Mine, the company was based in New Jersey and had C.A. Heller as president. Now, the company's property, 11 claims covering more than 160 acres, was on the east side of the property owned by the Tonopah Mining Company. There were two deep vertical shafts, 1,200 feet and 1,700 feet, with workings covering almost 39 miles. So the company, so you're talking about two different mining companies now in the same area. Um, the company also had to ship its ore to Miller's until 1912, when its own 60-stamp mill was built in Tonopah. So the mill had a capacity of 500 tons, and during its years of activity, 1912 through 1923, it was regarded as one of the country's best equipped and most efficient silver cyanide mines. 
Now, Tonopah's mines maintained very high yearly production until the Depression brought a slowdown. Now, mine production from 1900 to 1921, the peak years, was almost $121 million. I mean, Good night. Yeah, think about that. And just between 1900 and 1921, $120 million was pulled from the ground there. That's, I mean, now... $121 million is amazing, but that was right. probably billions of dollars back then. Yeah. They pay quarterbacks that. Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't, uh, looked at the conversion rate of the dollar what, back then. What that would have been worth then. Yeah. I should have before this episode, but you know, whatever it, it would, it, it would have been worth being able to do whatever the hell you wanted and nobody could stop you. That's a good point. I mean, I mean, let's face it. I mean, you know the the magnates of the you know the the first half of the 1900s. When you think of like Rockefeller and Hearst, right? I mean, these guys literally had money to burn. Literally, money to burn. Yep, lighten their cigars with a dollar. Yeah, they were they were the first people to do that. You know, just yeah, but light up. And and at the time in the country, you know, those people controlled whatever they wanted to control because they had so much money. Yep, you know, and you it, look at it, depression it, years; it was even easier for them to control whatever they wanted because everybody was hurting for money. Right. So you you think about this little small town with this booming mining operation. I mean, as a, as a town, this town had to be one of the richest in the country. I mean, they were pumping this stuff out and uh, they're making money hand over fist. Yep. They, out in the they, desert. They ended up with two different mining companies there at one point, you know, pulling that out. So, you know, they were doing well and that they were pulling some, some money out of the ground. If they were able to get two different, mining companies um you know drilling mines and stuff there it was it was amazing and and much like and much like now you had people that had enough money to wipe their rear ends with hundred dollar bills yeah and you had people that didn't know where their next meal was going to come from yeah exactly yeah the hell is the people, wrong with this country i don't know the people working the work in the mines had nothing the the people in charge you know they they were the ones that had all the money and and the people actually going down in the mines with the ones suffering from the depression. So, you know, oh, well, that was 120 years ago. Not that much has changed, but (laughs) we're we're not going to get into that. (laughs) That's a story for another podcast, Matt. Yeah. That was those stimulus checks for the miners. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) So this goes on to say that the biggest single year was 1913 when almost 10 million dollars in gold silver and copper and lead was mined 10 million in one year Matt yeah little did so, they know about the lead yeah right that that's a bad thing put that back <laughs> like maybe we shouldn't have mined all this lead yeah. see now if I could go back I'd say look put the put the lead back you're gonna have trouble with that in in yeah, a we're not gonna leave years. this alone yeah don't touch that like, wait now, a minute, people want to make fishing fishing weights with this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I understand that, but let's find something different because we're going to die from it. I promise you. <laughs> now, by World War II, only four major mining companies were operating. A huge fire in October 1942 destroyed the Tonopah Extension Mill and property and spread to a nearby hotel, causing $100,000 in damage. At the end of the war... Even these companies had left. The final blow came in 1947 when the Tonopah and Goldfield Rail- Railroad folded and its rails were torn up. So they they had a good run, but yeah. all of it kind of came to a close there in 1947. So now that we've talked about the town, let's look into the cemetery that's right there. Because this, I think... Like Matt and I were talking, this is kind of the 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 focal point for what's happening in the town. 
Um, this this may possibly be the cause of all the stuff that Matt's going to talk about here shortly. Now, this information comes from Find a Grave. If you've never been to findagrave.com, you actually should. It's very interesting what you can find there. And you can find a grave, just like the hey, site says. It so, sounds like you could find a grave. That's yep. If you're if you're looking for somebody in particular, go to that website. Now, if you need a new car, don't go to findagrave.com. No. Or, you know, find a graveyard. That's that's a whole nother thing. But that's one that Matt and I are developing. <laughs> Every, no matter what you're searching, it leads back to our website. That's right. <laughs> so find a graveyard. Always takes newest, you to graveyardpodcast.com. Do a so, search engine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this, this says that only one person has been interred here since its closure. Um, and that was Mr. Coombs in 1996 and that was by his own request so since this cemetery closed you know he's the only one that said hey i want to be buried in that cemetery now this was tonopah's first cemetery the old tonopah cemetery was started may 7th 1901 with the burial of john randall weeks at the site the body of weeks was moved to the new cemetery in 1911 but he was the first one there now the cemetery served Tonopah until April 1911, when due to the growth of the town and the mining area, expansion was no longer possible, and a new site was then opened a mile west of town. Now, many of Tonopah's pioneer residents are buried in the cemetery, which contains over 300 bodies. Among them are many victims of the 1902 Tonopah Plague. So, there, there was actually a plague here in Tonopah, which kind of adds to the energy of the town as we've talked before you have all these big things that happen it's going to leave a residue now in 1902 there was a terrible disease that swept through Tonopah what started as chest pains led to death within a number of hours and dissections carried out to understand the horrific disease found that the livers of the victims were completely black and hard like stone now, the cause of the disease was accepted to be pneumonia caused by poor sanitation. But I figured it would be lead poisoning. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see the, you know, the pneumonia that starts as chest pains and stuff. But Matt, as a uh, medical professional, does pneumonia cause your liver to be completely black and hard like a stone? I, I am not a physician, don't claim to be one, but I can't say that I've ever heard of that. Right. Um, now, could it have been a virus that caused pneumonia that affected your liver? Sure. That's possible, yeah. Um, but I can't say that I've ever heard of that. So. Yeah, like you said, it could have been something that caused your immune system to weaken and then pneumonia took over. And that's what actually killed you, but it was from something else that immediately affected your liver. Mm. So, it you know, it's it's odd, but the official, you know, records about what the 1902 plague was is pneumonia. But I, I kind of have my doubts that that's, a, you know, exactly what it was. But who am I to say? Again, Matt is closer to the medical field than I am. I'm... I don't even claim to be one or play one on TV or anything. I just make wild assumptions that I've pulled out of my rear end. Yeah. So, you know. In a town full of miners, you got to think maybe they dug up something, <clears throat> some kind of bacteria or yeah. something that just they just were able to spread. Yeah, you know, that's miners, highly possible. Miners go home, you know, they go throughout the town, you know, go to the local pub or whatever, and pretty soon there's all these people that are, that are sick and dying from some kind of weird bacterial infection. Yep. Who knows? We know it's that, uh, you know, the permafrost, people, scientists now are digging up viruses in the permafrost that are dormant. Mm -hmm. So it, it, to me, it's not unlikely that they could have, like you said, run into something that, you know, a bacteria deep down there that nobody knew about and may still not know about. But this goes on to say that, also buried in the cemetery are 14 victims of the Tonopah Belmont fire of February 23rd, 1911. 
They were some of the last persons to be buried here. Now, among others buried at the site is Nye County Sheriff Thomas Logan, who was killed in a shootout in a Man- Manhattan bordello. So we've got a lot of violent deaths or, you know, sick, sickly deaths, not just like old age deaths here in the cemetery. So that kind of adds to that energy surrounding the place. Now, I mentioned the Tonopah Belmont mine fire of February 23rd, 1911. So let's look into that. This comes from the the U.S. Mine Disasters website. Yes, I went to that website. I wanted to check out mine disasters. So we're going to talk about that. That's not a, a site you want to stay on and read a whole lot, like <laughs> continually. That's depressing. It sound like it, yeah. No, it. it I I didn't stay on there much after <laughs> after yeah. I read some of the stuff. Now, on the U.S. Mine Disaster site, they say that in a fire at this mine, seventeen men lost their lives. The fire should not have been a serious one, but you know, little damage was. Uh, actually done to the mine in the long run but it was discovered while it was still small and it was attacked for some time at close quarters but the unfamiliarity of the men with firefighting methods together with a reversal of the air currents permitted an insignificant blaze to develop into an appalling disaster they say now this goes on to say that the belmont mine had two shafts the Belmont, normally upcast, and the Desert Queen, normally downcast. Smoke was first noticed at, by the cager about 5.50 a.m. An hour or two of searching was required before the fire was discovered at the bottom of a winds on an inter, intermediate level, which did not open into either shaft, but communication was by means of the winds and two raises to the level above. So if you're a miner, you know what that means. If not, um, this shaft didn't really have out that that was used for communication. Now, the fire was burning uh, some mine timber that had been piled at the wind's bottom for distribution into the stopes. It seems reasonably sure that the fire was caused by a lighted candle or a snuff left in the timber by a man of the night shift, which had quit work at 3.30 a.m. So sometime between 3.30 when he quit and 5.50 when it was noticed, it started to take hold. Now, it was decided to build a bratis in the drift and close the winds above the fire. So this was hopefully to, like, snuff it out. Up to this time, dent smoke was present in only a few parts of the mine, and although the smoke issuing from the Belmont shaft prevented the descent of the men, many of them, including the timberman, entered the mine through the Desert Queen shaft. When the fire was discovered, men were detailed to withdraw everyone from the mine except those fighting the fire. The men were scattered and did not obey orders promptly, so when the disaster occurred, a good many men were underground in various parts of the mine. Now, it is uncertain as to exactly what happened, but apparently some reversal of the air currents forced the smoke into parts of the mine that had previously been safe. The men who died were trapped at different points. Several in the shaft stations, whether they had crawled crawled there uh, and then were unable to signal, isn't really known. But according to one report, four men were overcome and fell off the cage while being hoisted up. Now, the fire was put out that same night by an organized party, and the bodies of the men were recovered the next morning. Now, it goes on to give a little thing here that I wanted to tell about um, William F. Big Bill Murphy. He was apparently the hero of the Belmont Mine Fire. Now, they go on to talk about him, and they say that on the day of the fire, Big Bill, age 28, was the cage operator at the Belmont Mine. So he was the lift guy now fire broke out on the 1166 level between 2 30 and 4 30 a.m and by 6 30 a.m when big bill's shift began shift bosses had entered the mine to determine a way to fight the fire a group of miners were sent to explore other areas to determine the extent and fight the fire however some of these men disobeyed and started for the surface In no time, thoughts of extinguishing the fire vanished as workers were literally gasping for breath, attempting to escape. 
As smoke filled the tunnels, panic set in among those in the mine, and they made a hasty retreat to the cage. As they arrived at the surface, surface, some were unconscious due to the toxic gases and smoke. With men still underground, no one came forward at first to descend back into the mine, not wanting to return to the hell from which they just escaped, obviously. Only Big Bill came forward and gave the signal to descend. He first went to the 1100 level and loaded the cage with confused and unconscious miners. After this first ascent, he helped with their unloading and descended again for a second time to bring more to the surface. It's said that someone said he was nearly done in as he made his third descent into the mine. The third descent would be his last. So Big Bill died trying to save people. So they consider him the hero of the fire there. All right, Matt. So let's talk about our next sponsor, Native. Now, this year, we're all looking forward to a fresh start. And I know personally, you know, last year we, we started going to the gym and getting healthier. And then everything happened and we had to stop being able to go to the gym and, you know, couldn't do anything like that. So my plan this year is definitely I'm going to start eating better and going to start walking more. Because this whole sedentary thing has not been good for me. <laughs> so that's that's one of my goals that I want to accomplish for this year. You know, a fresh start. Let's get moving. Let's get more active. Go back to the gym if I can, or at least get out walking. And a great way to start fresh is with some self-care and fresh scents from Native. Native aluminum-free deodorant is a great addition to your 2021 routine. Native cares about what you put on your armpits. That's why their deodorant's ingredients list includes things you've actually heard of, like coconut oil and shea butter. Another plus, none of their products are tested on animals and almost everything is vegan. Switching to Native from an antiperspirant doesn't mean you'll have to worry about that midday BO either. Native will have you walking around smelling like coconut and vanilla, citrus and herbal musk, or maybe even lavender or rose. Now, the coconut... I like that citrus one. That's my favorite. Yeah. Now, the coconut vanilla is the one that I'm using. So, right. Now, you can choose from over 10 scents, including their classics and rotating seasonals, so you're guaranteed to find one that you'll love. Native Deodorant has over 16,000 five-star reviews and has been featured on the Today Show for a reason. It works. So make the switch to Native today by going to nativedo.com slash grave and use promo code grave at checkout to get 20% off your first order. That's nativedo.com slash grave and use promo code grave at checkout for 20% off your first order. That's right. To get 20% off your first order, go to nativedo.com slash grave and use the promo code grave at checkout. That's nativedo.com slash grave and use the promo code grave, G-R-A-V-E, at checkout. So... The last thing I want to touch on real quick before I hand this over to Matt here is the Clown Motel. Uh, yeah, this place. Yeah. I knew about this place. Didn't realize this was where it was. Yep. Now, I think everybody, uh, if you want to see pictures of it, we're posting them on our Patreon page um, the night that this episode drops so you can go see it. But if you have a fear of clowns, or you just think they're kind of creepy like I do, you won't like this place at all. Um, but this article says that um, it all started in 1985 when Leona and Leroy David built this motel in memory of their father, Clarence David, who died in the Belmont Mine Fire um, and is actually buried at the old Tonopah Cemetery right next door. Their father, who was a clown lover, left a collection of 150 clowns in his home, which they decided to use as a theme and focal point of their motel in memory of their father. Now, the clown motel was named America's Scariest Motel due to its clown theme and proximity to the cemetery. I'll give you that. Now, it's interesting to point out that none of the clowns 
at the Clown Motel are actually scary. Yeah, they're not like Gacy type. Yeah, at least the ones, you know, that are around on the signs and the ones in the lobby. You know, they're just regular clowns. Yeah, they're not intentionally scary. Out in the desert. Right. Which it just, you just look at it and for some reason it just gives you the creeps. You're like, yeah, it why does. is this out here? Man, any any building with that many clowns and clown dolls in the same area is just, I mean, it seems unnatural to be honest with you. Yeah, you know, it's the reason why I I, I didn't really uh, I I didn't really enjoy like circus circus in Las <laughs> yeah. Vegas. You know, it's like too much of this. Right, <laughs> right. So this concludes by saying in 1995, Bob and Deborah Perchetti bought the Clown Motel. Um, a mild mannered and benevolent gentleman, Bob's dedication and passion to his hometown shown through to all the guests who passed through the motel. And, you know, they actually took the time to mention what a great, great host he was when they were leaving the reviews on different websites and stuff like that. But I mean, great host doesn't make up for creepy ass clowns, you know? (laughs) Oh, and it, it gets, it gets a little worse. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk about that here in a few minutes. So, um, so I mean, you know, yeah, this this town's got some got some interesting history. You know, it's a, a mining town. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of death. You know, from not just from you know the mine. And I mean, we're talking about seventeen people that died in the mine fire. That's you know, out of all the people that probably worked in the mines through those years. That's probably not a, a large percentage. However, right, we've talked about this before. In, in in when we talked about the Tommy Knockers, mining is not a very safe occupation. No, there are, there are a lot of da- even now in in modern times. You know, mining is a dangerous job. Yep, and you can only imagine in the early nineteen hundreds how much more dangerous it would have been. So there were, I'm sure a lot of miners that lost their lives through accidents, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, cave-ins or just inhalation. But I mean, they didn't have, you know, the, the equipment that is available now. Um, Right. You know, that they understood enough to be able to do it. But the long-term effects of, of working in a mine like this, like I said, they were mining lead. I mean, yeah, they didn't know. They didn't realize that, you know, you know, you've got all this lead and you're around it every day and you're inhaling, you know, the powder from mining it. You know, they're probably making stuff out of lead that's, you know, touching food and water and, and who knows. And it, it was dangerous. Yeah. So sanitation sure that- wasn't a big thing either. Yeah, so I'm sure there there was a lot of death involved around there. Then we're we're talking about this mysterious plague that, um, you know, killed so many people in the town. Um, a, a a lot of things that would make you believe. Eh, I bet this little desert town is is haunted. Sure. Well, it is. <laughs> you you <laughs> to guessed, put it mildly, you guessed right. So the the first place I want to talk about is the Mizpa Hotel. And, you know, Adam mentioned Mizpa earlier. Um, you know, the, the, the Mizpa Hotel uh, was a pretty popular place. And it uh, hmm, it had a reputation for hosting ladies of the evening. Right. Uh, and one in particular is known as the Lady in Red. Now, as the story goes, the lady in red was a prostitute who conducted her business at the Mizpah Hotel in the 1920s. Now, the story says that a wealthy man murdered her in a room on the fifth floor in a fit of rage after learning he was only one of her many customers. I, 
Really? Somebody should have handed him a dictionary and said, uh, if you look in the P section under prostitutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, by it's by just, definition. That's silly. <laughs> so anyway, that, it's a story. But yeah. there's another version of the story that says that the lady in red's husband caught her cheating on him at the hotel after he had missed a train and came back. You know, you got again, you got to be pretty naive to just like, you know, even then, you know, then the the profession of prostitution wasn't quite looked down upon like people do today for some reason. You know, it was just considered work. And, you know, like, in my opinion, if that if that's your thing, do your work. You know what I mean? But. Even then, they knew what it was. Oh, so yeah. I don't, I don't understand the confusion about what it was. Like you think that dude that you think she's not with other people, and so then you fly into a fit of rage and everything. You should yeah. know, you know, That's it's right. not like she was trying to hide it from anybody. So I, I mean that that. That guy, that guy, silly man. He is silly. <laughs> well, you know, we're we're talking about Nevada, but you know, it, Adam's right. It 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 was commonplace, especially in towns like Tonopah, you mm-hmm. know, mining town. It brought a lot of men. I mean, you know, women women weren't working in the mines in the early 1900s. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, a lot of ladies just they they took an opportunity you know, to, uh, to, to make a little money. Mm -hmm. Now the legend says that the ghost of the lady in red roams the hotel to this day. And she's been seen by visitors in the hallways, um, wearing a white dress. No, I'm, I'm kidding. She's wearing a red dress. (laughs) I was about to ask. I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) And I was like, I expected a, a, a quicker response from Adam well, when I said that. <laughs> did you see the look on my face, yeah, though? That he was, was... He's like, he's like dumbfounded. He's like, what? <laughs> Lady, and where'd she get her name if she's wearing a white dress? I don't That's understand. Right. That's right. You know. But she she lived in a large suite on the fifth floor, uh, but it has since been divided up into multiple rooms. Now, room 502 is where she tends to frequent. And staff has been reported to have said that they don't like going in, going on to the fifth floor, much less into room 502. Um, I even found a, a trip advisor uh, review that said that they had heard one of the, uh, the cleaning staff say they, they were afraid to go into room 502. Hmm. Now, if that many people are afraid something's going on. There. Right now in this area, in this room, uh, the lady appears at all hours. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's not necessarily at night. And she does have a habit of sitting on the bed as guests try to try to sleep or standing in the shadows watching them. Now, some who say they have seen her have discovered a pearl on their pillows or nightstands. Now, well, that's neat. This is supposedly a sign that she likes you. However, if you get on her bad side... She's more likely to throw a tantrum and toss objects or furniture around the room. I thought she was going to leave a a piece of coal or a duty on the pillow. (laughs) Duty on the pillow. (laughs) Look at the chocolate, Bob. Oh, wow. (laughs) Complimentary chocolate. Wait, no, never mind. Bob's over there going, this is the worst chocolate I've ever had. (laughs) Right. Why is there corn in this chocolate? Just doesn't. (laughs) That's bad chocolate. Nevada's now, got bad chocolate. <laughs> now, now some of the male guests have reported having a female voice whisper, hey, you, into their ears while riding the elevator. And she's also been known to carry visitors to the fifth floor, regardless of which button is pushed. Hmm. And uh, I did I did read I did read one story that was kind of a just a, a personal blog story that said that. When they got on the elevator, the fifth floor was already pushed. <laughs> I was like, well, that's a little creepy. Huh. Yeah. We know now, where you're going. Just go here. 
<laughs> now, the lady in red is not the only spirit that haunts the Mizpah Hotel. Uh, the other one it is the ghost of Senator Key Pittman, who supposedly spent his final night at the Mizpah Hotel in 1940 and died there right before the upcoming election. Now, this is this is where it gets interesting. It is said that his entourage decided to keep his body hidden away on ice in the bathtub in order to not upset the election. And only what? only after Pittman had won did they come clean about his death and have him given a proper burial. I'm thinking, how long did they manage to keep his body? No kidding. <laughs> I mean, no you had a kidding. tub full of, full of ice. And you've got this dead guy laying in there that you're trying to hide from the public because he might win the election. That's uh, okay. <laughs> that's wild. The room where he supposedly died is now called the Senator's Suite, and it's supposedly haunted by the dead senator. Although he's mostly benign, and no one really has has reported anything malicious. Some witnesses have explained that he almost seemed to be lonely and seemed to be trying to communicate with them. Now, uh, the next one is is miners, which, you know, could we could we have a haunted mining town without spectral miners? I mean, I don't think so. Uh, so the, the Mizpah Hotel has the spirits of two miners that are said to lurk in the basement. Now, according to the story, three miners dug up, dug up into the basement in order to steal a stash of silver that was being stored there in, in, in a section that was used kind of like a vault. Now, they were apparently successful, but one of the three turned on the others, shot and killed them in order to keep all of the silver for himself. What a jerk. Yeah. To, to this day, the miners are said to still be down there and are known to be very mischievous, often uh, poking or prodding guests. They also drain electronic batteries. They pull at people's shirts. They knock off hats and they try to trip people. Now, I'm just going to say, if I go in any place and it's haunted, you can trip me, you can push me, but do not flick my hat off my head. That <laughs> makes me so angry. Yes. I hate it when like buddies would do that to me, hit the brim and like <sighs> I'm very particular about my hats. I don't want them dirty and on the floor, you know, especially in a mine. I don't want that dirt all over them. I mean, I clean my hat in Scotch Garden all the time. I don't need this landing on a mine floor. So <laughs> to make me <laughs> The angriest you could ever make me is flip my hat off as a spectral being. You come and knock my hat off, and I don't even get the ability to hit you. That's, That's right. not fair. That's right. You know? I mean, I'd punch a dude that did that to me I, in right? high school. I mean, I I wore a hat all the time. Maybe that's why I'm bald now. Yeah. But people You're not come helping up me like, out, Matt. Flip, flip the bill of your hat. They're like, man, oh, I'll dude. punch you. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> hate that then you got ghosts doing that ghost That's, miners flipping your hat off that is the rudest thing any ghost i've ever heard is done i don't care what <laughs> scratching whatever i don't care that's the worst thing that i've heard flip flip your hat it's the worst this guy Absolute. got possessed but at least he got to keep his hat on <laughs> exactly at least he didn't flip his hat off you know i mean the hell's that mess <laughs> So the third floor of the hotel is also supposedly very active. And here people report hearing the sounds of, of disembodied voices and children's laughter. They, they also hear mm -mm. the footfalls of tiny little running feet. Mm -mm. Nope. Yeah. It's Adam. Nope. Adam's like, I'm out. <laughs> yep. I mean, I was mad at the hat. I'm I'm leaving with the the pitter patter of little feet. I'm place, I'm leaving. This place is not. Adam will not visit the Bispa Hotel. No, nope. when he goes to Tonopah. No, nope, definitely not. <laughs> now, employees and guests alike have also claimed that these ghostly children have a habit of of asking what they're doing, usually in a hushed whisper. 
Now, what's really odd about this particular haunting is that according to the hotel's manager, no children are on record as to ever having died in the hotel. Hmm. Nevertheless, the sounds of these ghostly children are one of the most commonly reported phenomena at the hotel, and EVP recordings of them have been captured by paranormal investigators. So that makes me ask the question, is is it one of these two things or maybe a combination of? Is it one, that the Mizpah Hotel is like a focal point and attracting these ghosts so that the kids from other areas around the town are coming there due to the energy or whatever? Or is it something mimicking children? Could be. You know, we've talked about that before, too. So to me, it's one of those two, and I don't know which one it is. And I mean, interested what other people think, you included, you know, what, what is it like a hub or is it like trickster? I don't know, but can you imagine you're, you're working at the hotel or something and it's quiet and you get a, a little childlike whisper in your ear going, what are you doing? No, oh, dude, yeah. I'd be like, I'm crapping in my pants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you think exactly I'm doing? what I'm doing. Will you quit sticking <laughs> up on me? Yeah. <laughs> you caused this. Now, uh, in a, Tonopah resident Shirley Perkins recounts that when the Mizpah Hotel was being remodeled, uh, she and her friends would go up on the floors to see if it was really haunted. Now, Shirley remembers being in one of the hallways and hearing loud music, music, playing at the other end when she reached what she thought was the source it fell quiet now she also describes a time where she stood outside of a room she knew was empty but suddenly heard loud knocking on the wall on the other side of the door hmm that'll freak you out yeah it will and uh that's a pretty cool interview uh, it's a little brief spot in a in a video that I included in our sources, so you can go watch it. It's um, and I'm going to mention them again. Um, it's it's by a group called Paranormal Voyage, and they they have done, you know, at least more than a couple investigations in Tonopah and some of the the buildings around there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not very long. It's worth checking out. They they, they do capture a lot of uh, activity in that in that video, and it's very well put together. But one of the places they talk about in that video is the Tonopah Liquor Company. Now, the, you know, like I said, the Mizpah Hotel is, is definitely not the only haunted spot. Um, the, the liquor company has plenty of paranormal activity of its own. Now, during an interview with investigators from Paranormal Voyage, owner Tiffany Gregory recounted some of the spirits, uh, some of the experiences she's had in, in the TLC, as it's known. Now, the main floor of the two-story building is reportedly the most active. Now, Tiffany explains that there is a motherly spirit present known as Hattie. Now, she says the encounters with Hattie have always had a positive vibe. And she describes one encounter in particular where she was cleaning the bar and her young son began crying. Now, Tiffany says she was still nursing at the time. And so she quickly finished her tasks and went to wash up before holding her son. Now, she believed that walking away from her hungry child to clean up would cause hysterical crying. But that was not right. the case. When she returned, she found him looking up and smiling as if someone was standing above him playing. Now, that's creepy. It is kind of creepy. But she says it just it really makes her feel happy that there there's that spirit there just kind of looking after the place. If if you feel like it's looking after you and your kid, then that that makes it better. But it it's still like you're interacting with my kid, right? You know, and I can't tell who you are. That's a little creepy. Uh huh. Now one of the other spirits is that of George, or more properly, George the Devil Davis. Yeesh. Now, George is definitely a prankster, and in Tiffany's words, he gets excited, especially when someone claims to be a non-believer. But honestly, she says, it seems like he just likes to mess with people. Now, she recalls one occasion when a blogger visited the TLC for an interview. He arrived with a nice camera and asked if he could take some pictures, 
but the blogger found that his expensive camera wouldn't work, almost as if it had locked up. So confused, he went outside, and surprise, the camera worked. But after coming back inside, Tiffany told him that George was probably messing with him. And now yeah. the, the blogger quickly discounted that, saying he didn't believe in all that. But as the interview resumed, Tiffany says a cork in one of the tequila bottles suddenly shot out flying across the room, <laughs> which, you know, tequila is not is not something that you would expect to blow a cork out of the bottle. It's not effervescent like no, champagne. Not at all. Effervescent tequila, though. What about that? <laughs> yeah, I, I've noticed that tequila makes me blow my cork, but that's a whole nother <laughs> Whole nother thing. There. <laughs> now, Tiffany has also said that uh, also said that George has been known to throw plates, causing them to smash to the floor. And this particular event was witnessed by Tiffany and her mother-in-law. Hmm. Now, although the majority of the activity in the TLC occurs on the main floor, Tiffany says there are two areas in the basement that have a distinct energy. She says the presence in the corner just gives a feeling of wanting to be left alone. So investigators report seeing shadow figures moving from one area of the bar to the other, often traveling from the main floor down the stairs to the basement. Now, Tiffany says there are areas in the basement that have caused her to feel very uneasy. In particular, the far end of the basement just past where the last light bulb hangs. Tiffany explains that in in that area, others have reported seeing the apparition of a man standing with his arms crossed, almost as if he were waiting for something. And she hmm. said that his attitude was definitely one of go away. Oh, wow. Now, during the tour of the basement, Tiffany asked one of the investigators if she's okay. Now, investigator Celia Ramos said she felt as if something had just slapped her hand. Now, during this investigation, Celia would be touched again, and during a spirit box session in the basement, a voice could be heard responding with its name, David, and then later, Dave. So it just so happens that one of the owners of the Tonopah Liquor Company in the early 1900s was one David Holland. Hmm. So could that could that be the ghost of one of the former owners that's Taking up residence in the basement? Could be. I don't know, but it sure sounds that way. Yeah. Hey, Adam, let's take a minute and talk about one of tonight's sponsors, HelloFresh. And with HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking easy, fun and affordable that's why it's america's number one meal kit and you've heard adam and i talk about every plate another home meal delivery kit hello fresh and every plate are the same company okay mm -hmm. we include both because of the variety that you get so exactly you, you choose hello fresh every plate you've got multiple selections to choose from to, to really make mealtime an event. Now, HelloFresh, as I said, cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or less. That's right. And you can cut down on grocery bills and food waste because HelloFresh delivers the pre-portioned ingredients so you're not overbuying, which is a burden on the planet and your wallet. And we do that a lot. You overbuy and you think you're going to use it and you end up maybe only using a small part of it or you don't even use it because you forget it in your refrigerator and then you've wasted that money and when you're cleaning out your refrigerator later you go oh yeah I was going to make something with this and now it's rotten right well HelloFresh keeps you from doing that because they only send you what you're going to need and I know for us Michael enjoys it. He gets excited when it's a HelloFresh meal and he gets to help, which 
you know, sometimes he doesn't get to uh, because we kind of don't know what we're doing. We're just <laughs> throwing all the crap in a pan, you know. But HelloFresh has the the recipe that you can follow so you can put the kids on prepping vegetables or something like that while you're doing other stuff and cut down the time even more, you know? Yeah, and, and my kids get excited when they hear that a, a HelloFresh box is on its way. And we love we love the recipe cards that come with it because yeah, not only are you getting the ingredients where you know you can make this meal perfectly, you can save that recipe card and you can make it again because now you've done it. You know what you're doing, right? You, right. you know what to buy, and, and you know how to put it together and, and make that meal again. But Adam's right, being able to involve the entire family with more than just making dinner it, it's like i said it's an event it's you know it's it's a it's mm-hmm. almost like a celebration the kids are excited because they know they get to help they know they're going to have something really good to eat like those gouda cheeseburgers that we had wow oh yeah, yeah. amazing amazing there there's a citrus like honey citrus chicken that we had one time you make this like honey citrus glaze to put on the chicken jude we have made that quite a few times even after you know we uh did it that first time with the box because we got the recipe and oh my god that's like my favorite one it's it's amazing so yeah the the cards that you get to keep really help out like matt said yeah so if adam and i are making you hungry talking about the delicious food that you can get from HelloFresh, all you have to do is go to hellofresh.com slash 10 graveyard that's one zero G-R-A-V-E-Y-A-R-D and use that code 10 Graveyard for dig this 10 free meals including free shipping that's amazing like Matt said if you want to get the 10 free meals which is just that that's a lot of food you can go to hellofresh.com slash 10 graveyard that's HelloFresh.com slash 10GRAVEYARD and use that code 10 Graveyard and get those 10 free meals and free shipping. Now, this next one is, is kind of, uh, it's, it's a short one, but it's interesting. It happens at uh, the Tonopah Historic Mining Parks Visitor Center. Not really a place you would expect to be haunted. So, Not the first place you'd think of. So you might not consider a visitor center to be a hotbed of spirit activity, but it is said that if you look up at the windows, you will see the ghost of Bina Verrault looking down at you. Now, who's Bina Verrault, you ask? I'm, Who's Bina Verrault? I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Now, Bina Verrault was from New York, and she made national headlines after her and a friend made a pact to become wealthy widows and collected clothes and jewelry to today's value of over $2.5 million from the hmm. men that they had seduced. Ah. Now, Bina went on the run and ended up in Tonopah, where she died of alcoholism. Hmm. Interesting. That is interesting. I mean, I guess if she you was, just got to get away, Tona Paw is as good a place as any. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if you think about it, she's seen at the visitor center. She died there as a visitor. Maybe there's something to that. Maybe, maybe the visitor center sits on a piece of property that was something else at one time. Yeah. Now, so we we would again be remiss if we didn't discuss you know, the most well-known haunted or otherwise locations in Tonopah, the Clown Motel, as Adam Mm -hmm. talked about earlier. Now, guests have argued over whether or not the hotel is actually haunted. But if you have a fear of clowns, this might be hell on earth for you. Uh, I've known people that were afraid of clouds, and, you know, it is bizarre. I mean, I don't think I've yeah. ever been afraid of clowns. I've thought that clowns can be creepy in the right circumstance, but never yeah. had to fear. I'm not, I'm not actually afraid of clowns, but I, I do find most of them creepy. 
because I always have that thought, what are you hiding behind all the mask, uh, behind all the makeup, you know? Um, and then ever since Gacy and his that, whole yeah. clown thing, that adds that creep factor to it because you can't tell exactly who they are. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're fake smiling, you know, for some reason. There's a, a creep factor to me about clowns, but I'm not, like, I wouldn't say I'm afraid of them, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. I agree with you. Now, the hotel lobby boasts over 2,000 clowns. Yeah. All, all staring at you as you check in. <laughs> now, mm. the current owner, or as he prefers to be called, the CEO of the Clown Motel. <laughs> now, I'm probably, I'm, I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, um, but the best I can find figure from looking it up it is Haim Anad and uh his family is uh a Las Vegas uh hotelier they they own other right. hotels around the world now when they purchased the clown motel um but as we said the the uh the family that owned it um uh, they wanted whoever continued uh, operating the clown motel to to keep the clown motif, right? And and so uh, Anon has done that, but he's added to it. Now he has he has made several horror themed rooms, including mm. the, the Exorcist, Friday the Thirteenth, It of course, and Halloween. So oh wow. So if it if it's not creepy enough to go stay at the clown motel, you can actually stay in a horror themed room, um, which that's pretty creepy to me. I, I, yeah, I, that's I wild. definitely am not going to stay in the exorcist room. No, <laughs> like, no. All the other ones I think I could probably manage, but the exorcist one, I'm out. <laughs> don't push your luck, you know. <laughs> that's right. Now, now, as I said, guests disagree on the validity of paranormal activity here, but several have become true believers after a night in the motel. Now, some have reported hearing knocking on their door in the middle of the night, only to find no one there. One guest reported hearing a creepy laugh from just outside of her door. She also reported feeling cold spots in her room and the feeling of something or someone poke her in the arm during the night. It's, you know, it's poking is a big thing in Tonopah. You know, the ghost is like, Apparently. kind of poke. You know, this is how mm. we're going to let you know we're here. We're going to poke. Don't, don't yeah. poke me. You know, yeah, I don't that, like being rude. poked. <laughs> it's rude. Now, one other visitor claimed to have heard voices all through the night and then awoke to find scratches on the wall. Yeah. It's not what you want. That's, that's not what you want to find when you wake up. No. You, you might you might you might leave somebody a bad Yelp review for that. <laughs> yeah. I woke up, scratches on my wall. I don't know. A one star. <laughs> one star. But the creepiest part of the hotel is not a part of the hotel at all. The clown motel sits directly next door to the old Tonopah Cemetery, which Adam mentioned earlier. And it's the resting place of some 300 souls. Now, interestingly enough, the graves of Bina Veralt and George the Devil Davis can be seen here in the cemetery. And although there really isn't any documented activity in the cemetery, as we mentioned, it could be the source of all the strange activity throughout the town. So, yeah, I mean, you've got this haunted town with this really old cemetery. And, you know, we're, we're going to have some pictures for you to see. I mean, this this place is, it's different. I mean, yeah. the, the headstones look different. It's it's by no means a traditional cemetery. I even, like it. Even Yeah, even for, even for the time. I mean, you know, we're, you know, we're talking about, well, we've talked about cemeteries that are, you know, hundreds of years old with big stone monuments and things like that. Still, what you mm -hmm. would expect to see. This is not that way. I mean, you no, know, you got a lot of wooden, small wooden ones, some small wooden crosses, you know, just in kind of a ramshackle yeah. 
cemetery, and and I like that in a way. Yeah, you know, it, it creepy old rusted short fence around it, and just it's just it's yeah. got that cool vibe. You got stones, you know, laid out marking the area of the grave. You've got metal mm-hmm. metal incorporated into a lot of the grave markers. Um, yeah, it, it's really unique. It, I, I mean, honestly. When you look at it, you go, yeah, this is exactly what I would expect a cemetery out in the middle of a desert to look like. You know, right, if, if, right. If, you had, if you had to tell me, hey, hey, Matt, come up with a, with a theme for a cemetery, an old cemetery that's out in the middle of the desert. This is probably what it would look like. Um, right. You know, but as I said, there's really not any activity that goes on in the cemetery. Plenty of people have visited and tried. I mean, there's been tons of investigations. I mean, there are numerous videos on youtube of amateur investigators strolling through this cemetery at night recording and nothing happens or or they scare the willies out of themselves yeah um you know standing out in this dark cemetery in the desert in the middle of the night but i mean is there a chance that this is like a battery for all the energy that fuels these hauntings throughout the rest of the town i mean it I mean, we're not talking about that. we're not talking about a cemetery in the middle of Chicago. I mean, this is yeah. a little bitty town, you know. So, if you had a a big energy source like that, you know, sure. I mean, the entire town could be haunted. Right, right. I, I mean, it makes sense to me that you know between the energy of what has happened at that town, the disasters, the plague, the you know, the killings, all that stuff, and to have them all buried in that small little cemetery there. I, I can see how they wouldn't necessarily stay around the cemetery, but they would go about, you know, their haunts there in the town. Yeah. Because like you said, it's a small town. It's not traveling, you know, 30, 40 miles to get to their house again or whatever. So Yeah. And it, it, it'd be interesting to know if if all the ore that, you know, was in the ground, had something to do with with fueling some of that energy or the fact sure. that people were digging way way down mm-hmm. um you know could could they had uh, unearth some type of negative energy that causes these sure. spirits to you know to be bound to to the town um sure. you know a, a, a lot of theories you know for for why this this little desert town is so haunted Right. Um, but a, a pretty amazing place. Um, I, I don't know that we've ever had any, any listeners that would have visited there unless they, they live not far from there. Well, to be honest with you, I posted on Twitter today that we were covering this on Friday yeah. and had one person tweet and say, I was just there today. Wow. So, yeah, believe it or not, somebody was just in Tonopah today. Um, you know, w- when you're listening to this, it'll be several days ago, but. Yeah, it, it was, I didn't think I would see that tweet that someone had been to Tonopah. I, I wouldn't have expected it either, but that's pretty cool. So, yeah. So, you know, tell us what, what do you guys think? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot more information out there than what Adam and I were able to cover. Uh, like mm-hmm. I said, there's, there's plenty of videos of, of uh, professional and amateur investigators that have gone. There's, Plenty of interviews with folks in the town, um, you know, recounting some stories. The ones I picked out were just some of the most intriguing. Um, but, but you know, go check out some of that stuff and, and see what you think. You know, are these people right. all just playing a big hoax, trying to bring some visitors into town? Um, or, or, or is there something really legitimate going on there? Um, it, it doesn't really sound like there's anything all that malevolent there. You know, it doesn't sound like you know, a big dark shadow just hovering over the town. It just sounds like that a lot of these spirits never left. Yeah, just hanging out. So let us know what you guys think. Um, You know, you can join our Facebook group and let us know in there or email us or, you know, drop us a a voicemail if you want to. We got a voicemail. You can call and leave us a message. Uh, You know, any of those ways, reach out and let us know what you guys think. Yeah, absolutely. And don't forget to go check out our website, it's uh, graveyardpodcast.com, and on our website, uh, you can find links to purchase Graveyard Tales merchandise. Uh, you can find out a little bit more about Adam and myself. 
uh, you can listen to the show and you can become a patron. And we always take a moment to thank everyone who has donated to the show because it, it really helps us keep going. It allows us to put out more and more content more frequently for you guys. Don't mm -hmm. forget to go and rate and review us on iTunes because that is the way we come up the charts, which just makes it easier for people to find the graveyard. Right. So until next time, we'll save you a seat in the graveyard. See you soon.